Hello, I'm uh, John Gribbon and welcome to the 17th International Workshop on Non-Hodgkin's Lymphoma here in Boston. We're delighted to get another meeting off and going and this evening we had as our introductory talk uh, Jay Bradner, who's now the president of the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, to talk about what I set up as being something we want to see in this workshop, that is this interaction between industry and academia. Now, Jay, we're kind of in this environment now where there's a lot of talk about big pharma, the enemy, the expensive drugs, the cost of oncology. It's not the way I see things. I mm. kind of do see it as a partnership we have to work together. And in your talk tonight, you talked a lot about exactly that issue, about how you see uh, the collaboration being very fruitful in terms of being able to advance things for our patients. So can you tell us a little bit more then about your philosophy as, a, as the president of a major uh, institute doing research about what this kind of means for you? Uh, thanks, John. You know, it's understandable that uh, patients or physicians would um, have complex feelings about uh, large pharmaceutical companies. These are large multinational companies that are very profitable, and anytime profits are placed into the same context as medicine and healing, it's understandably complex. The part of Novartis where I work, though, is in research and drug discovery, and the institution I lead is um, uh, rest assured, you know, doing the best science that we can in service for patients, to purely organized around impact. Um, you know, our thesis is um, definitive medicines for life-threatening diseases. We have no cosmetics group at Nibber. And, you know, almost 40% of our $9 billion investment in drug discovery and drug development focuses on cancer. Working every day in those labs uh, around scientists and leading a research program on my own, um, I fail to really experience the difference in the ethos, um, in the effort, in the ambition, in the purpose of scientists in our organization than um, you know, before I arrived uh, back in academia. So we talked about this yesterday when you were telling me the size of your, the research budget. I, I was obviously incredibly impressed. We're all used to thinking the cost of drug discovery often being the cost of doing clinical trials, and of course that's very expensive. But I was very struck by how much of an investment Novartis is willing to pay into the kind of blue sky science at the very early end, often before there's any potential that that's going to lead. I mean, it's almost like a, a leap of faith to believe that some of these compounds are going to make it. We also know, of course, all the work that comes out about how many compounds make it from the, you were talking tonight about screening millions of potential compounds. So how do you as an organization think about, you know, is it, is it, is it science for science sake or is, is it really driven towards thinking that we're looking for a product? Well, as you say, Novartis really believes in fundamental and basic research, um, but our brand of discovery science is unapologetically translational, always, always with the patient in mind, always with the medicine in mind. But it's not enough to just pursue a target for drug discovery always to reach the highest hanging fruit. Sometimes we need to first innovate the new therapeutic science from which medicines will emerge. Novartis is probably similar to many large pharmaceutical companies in providing worldwide access to new and innovative medicines. Um, and we have a, a, a very robust research and development budget like other peer pharmaceutical companies. But Novartis is somewhat unique among a much smaller number of companies in investing in the type of research you describe. And this is ruthlessly strategic. You know, innovation is so widely democratized now that small focused biotechs, even academic centers and innovators, um, can often collect a lot of the lower hanging fruit. Having come from that environment and in biotech as well, you know, after three years of funding, the investors want to know well, what's the drug. And, yeah. After five years on a grant, the government rightly wants to know what's the progress in the plan. What this means is that there are some projects, there are some targets, there are some historic challenges that might never be approached because they don't fit the horizon of three years of series A, B, C, IPO, or a five-year renewable R01, both of which are very important research funding instruments. At Novartis, we enjoy a much longer horizon of research. It's not every program in the portfolio, but 
as we curated the portfolio last year, 25% of our 340 research projects approach science that we regard as intractable, the highest hanging fruit. These are targets like KRAS or CMYK in cancer. Um, these are targets like alpha-synuclein and Parkin and um, beta amyloid um, in neurodegenerative diseases. We may not find drugs in the first three years, but our company expects to be around 100 years from now, and so we try to play to this strength, leveraging the revenue from our medicines, um, generously supporting research that's directed at the highest hanging fruit. Another thing I was struck by and very impressed with tonight when you talked about things like the resources that you have that you're now making freely available to researchers. That's almost different from how I've thought of pharma in the past where everything was protected and IP controlled and, yeah. and, and not available to, to researchers. What's, you know, what was the philosophy behind that kind of approach? Well, the pharmaceutical industry is one of the most famously secretive industries yeah. in the world. But innovation is just everywhere now. And drug discovery and drug hunting is a team sport. And you don't always have all the right team members in your company. I learned as an academic practicing a more open brand of science how powerful it is to connect to experts, irrespective of their geography, their station, their level of promotion, to get the right experiment done or to generate some momentum behind an idea. When I was recruited to Novartis, I found a board and an executive committee very interested to apply um, experimental strategies inspired by open source to accelerate the, the science and improve the quality of the science. Um, it was really refreshing. We're just three and a half years into our strategic plan right now, but already we've started with threads of open science and alliances and collaborative approaches and external funding mechanisms. And it's early days, but we're starting to see you know, real pipeline projects emerge and important medicines um, realized for patients. Sure. Now, your, of course, own academic interest was in heme malignancies. Um, we often feel like the poor cousins in on oncology, where the big market is often in the solid tumor fields, and that's the the hanging fruit that the companies are going uh, are going after. But, of course, Novartis has a history of being very innovative and leading the way in, in heme malignancies also. Um, is that something we can expect to continue to see or is it just pure serendipity that a couple of the products that Novartis had happened to be very, very, I'd say, you know, life-changing and for, you know, Gleevec and CAR T cells, two perfect examples of, of just whole, you know, field shifting uh, uh, approaches that, that, that Novartis led. Uh, John, we're totally committed to hematologic malignancies. I, I believe that before Gleevec, maybe there was a different opinion, but the experience of bringing definitive medicine forward for patients for CML really had a big impact from the highest levels of the company down also to the laboratories. On the heels of Gleevec has come RIDAPT for acute myeloid leukemia and Kimraya for pediatric ALL and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And if you look at the deep and early pipeline and the types of projects that we're undertaking at Nibber, the discovery engine for Novartis, hematologic malignancies are very well represented. You know, through um, the successes of medicines for patients, but also as revenue generators at Novartis and other pharmaceutical companies, I think the secret is out now that blood cancers is a very exciting place to make medicines. There's a huge unmet need and that these medicines can be really important businesses for companies like ours. Uh, so we're very committed. Great. So here you, ha here you have it. Very exciting first night at IWNHL. We're hoping we're going to continue following on from the excitement that we felt uh, hearing Jay's talk tonight to be looking to put into practice how we can think about how our academic and pharmaceutical collaborations can work towards improving the outcome for our patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So stay tuned for more sessions from IWNHL in Boston.